had one in a coat and he he started like screaming at me. Did you get out with him? I mean, he did it. He did it. Did what? What did he say, yeah, Christine? He him. You love your husband? I love him very much. You love him very much? Yes. Okay. Your husband gives exact details of what happens. Hey guys, Marshall here. Thank you for joining me today. I have a truly shocking true crime case from Texas that I want to share with you. But please be warned that some of the details are extremely graphic and disturbing. This case involves the brutal murders of four young people that were close friends and the person responsible is someone you would never expect. Let's start at the beginning to provide some important context. The primary person involved in this tragedy is a young woman named Christine Paulilla. Christine was born on March 31, 1986 in Long Island, New York. From a very young age, she faced considerable hardship and trauma. When Christine was only about five years old, her father Charles suddenly and unexpectedly passed away in a construction accident. Losing her father at such a vulnerable age was understandably devastating for Christine. After Charles's death, Christine's mother Lori struggled immensely with her grief. She turned to alcohol and drugs to numb the intense pain of losing her husband. This ultimately led Lori to lose custody of both Christine and her brother. From there, the siblings went to live with Lori's parents, though this living situation was far from stable or nurturing. To make matters worse, around the same time Christine was also diagnosed with a condition called alopecia. Alopecia is an autoimmune disorder that causes the hair follicles to be attacked by the body's own immune system, leading to unpredictable hair loss. For Christine, this manifested in losing all the hair on her scalp, eyebrows, and eyelashes in clumps at a very young age. Can you imagine dealing with that as a child? It's unthinkable. To cope, Christine resorted to wearing cheap wigs from Halloween stores. The combination of her medical condition and unstable home life led to relentless bullying by her peers. Kids can be so cruel, and this took an immense psychological toll on Christine from a very early age. When Christine entered her teen years, things began looking up slightly. Her mother Lori had finally kicked her drug and alcohol addiction after remarrying. Wanting a fresh start, Lori and her new husband Tom moved their family to the suburb of Clear Lake City just outside of Houston, Texas. Christine enrolled as a freshman at Clear Lake High School. It was a large public school with over 2,000 students, which likely provided some anonymity and escape from her troubled past. During her first year at Clear Lake, Christine met two incredibly kind and popular junior girls named Rachel Colorotis and Tiffany Rowell. Rachel was a talented artist who loved creative writing. She was described by those close to her as caring, bubbly, and always looking out to help others. Tiffany had aspirations to be a social worker after graduating. Both girls took pity on Christine due to her medical condition and social awkwardness as a new student. Against all odds, they welcomed Christine into their friend group and helped boost her self-confidence in a major way. Christine would come home from school beaming about her new friends that she described as the sweetest girls ever. This was a remarkable turn of events considering Christine's traumatic childhood filled with rejection, bullying, and instability. Having the validation and support from Rachel and Tiffany, two of the most admired girls in the school, clearly meant the world to Christine. They helped her choose new wigs, did makeup and hair with her, and made her feel beautiful and popular for the first time. In a bittersweet twist of fate, this would sadly be the beginning of a deep friendship that would later turn deadly. After Rachel and Tiffany graduated in 2003, Christine entered her junior year at Clear Lake High. It was around this time that she started dating a local 18-year-old boy named Chris Snyder. By all accounts, Chris was truly bad news. He had a lengthy criminal record including arrests for auto theft, assault, and armed robbery. Despite repeatedly getting into legal trouble, Chris boasted about his gang involvement on social media and had several gang tattoos. Beyond just being a self-proclaimed gangster, Chris was also physically, verbally, 
and emotionally abusive towards Christine throughout their volatile relationship. Christine's family and friends deeply disapproved of Chris and tried desperately to convince her to leave him for her own safety. However, Chris had developed an almost cult-like control and manipulation over Christine. When they attempted to confront or discipline Chris, he would only further isolate Christine from her support system. According to a family friend, there was something in his eyes every time you saw him that just made you very uncomfortable. Due to Christine's extensive history with rejection and low self-esteem, it seemed she craved any affection even if it came at great cost in an abusive relationship. Around this same period, Christine also started actively using drugs like marijuana, ecstasy, and cocaine with Chris. Her family noticed a drastic change in her personality and behavior. Christine would constantly blow off family obligations to get high or party with Chris instead. When confronted about cutting ties, Christine insisted she just wanted to help Chris get better. It's a classic tale as old as time the abuser manipulates and isolates their victim while dependence on substances further clouds clear judgment. At just 17 years old, Christine was spiraling down a dark and destructive path under Chris' influence with no escape in sight. Now let's shift focus to that tragic July afternoon in 2003 that would change so many lives in an instant. Rachel Colotis had recently graduated from Clear Lake High and moved in with her longtime best friend Tiffany Rowell. The girls had plans that Saturday to have some close friends over for a casual get-together. Among the guests expected were Tiffany's 19-year-old boyfriend Marcus Priscilla and his cousin 18-year-old Aldebert Sanchez. Both boys were described as well-liked with bright futures ahead. Marcus was studying automotive technology at a community college with dreams of opening his own shop one day. Aldebert had recently relocated from a rough neighborhood in Houston seeking a safer environment and better opportunities. Around 3 p.m., Tiffany's good friend Brittany gave her a call. She wanted to let Tiffany know that she and some others were on their way over. Tiffany's boyfriend Marcus picked up the phone since Tiffany was in the bathroom. Brittany said she'd call back later so as not to interrupt. But when Brittany tried calling again 30 minutes later, no one answered. Since she was nearby with her boyfriend, nephew, and boyfriend's cousin, Brittany thought she'd stop by to check that everything was all right. A little after 6 p.m., Brittany pulled up outside Tiffany's house. She noticed Marcus's car and Tiffany's truck were there. Thinking her friends must be home, Brittany got out of the car. When she knocked on the door and peeked inside, it was very quiet. Concerned, she kept knocking louder until the door opened a little bit. The boys watched from the car as Brittany carefully went inside to make sure her friends were okay. Slowly stepping inside, she was immediately overwhelmed by the stench of blood and metal. Walking down the hallway towards the living room, Brittany was utterly unprepared for the massacre that awaited. The scene was more horrific than any horror movie. Tiffany, Rachel, Marcus and Aldebert's lifeless, bullet-riddled bodies were strewn across the living room in immense pools of coagulated blood. Blood and bullet fragments sprayed the walls and ceiling. Shell casings littered the carpet and furniture. It was the stuff of nightmares. Brittany let out an unearthly shriek before fleeing outside in hysterics to have her boyfriend call 911. When first responders arrived, they were equally stunned by the brutality and depravity on display. This was no ordinary homicide it was executed with extreme overkill and rage. The entire Clear Lake community was understandably rocked to its core. The four victims were beloved students and friends, not the type to get caught up in criminal matters at all. Local law enforcement and the FBI swarmed the scene looking for any shred of evidence to identify the callous assailants responsible for this premeditated mass slaughter. Autopsies revealed some of the victims endured multiple shots at point-blank range while likely still conscious in tremendous suffering. Others appeared to have defensive wounds, suggesting a prolonged torturous attack. With little physical evidence left behind and no witnesses, the investigation rapidly hit a wall. As weeks went by with no leads, public fear and speculation reached a fever pitch. Who could commit such a heinous act of evil? And why target these particular young people with everything to live for? Following the disastrous Columbine shooting just four years prior, terrorism and mass violence were fresh on everyone's minds. The killer or killers remained ominously at large. 
Meanwhile, a devastated Christine was struggling to process the loss of her two closest friends. She insisted to her mother Lori that Rachel and Tiffany had been like sisters to her. Inconsolable with grief, Christine took to sleeping in her parents' bed out of fear of being alone at night. However, her tumultuous relationship with Chris Snyder only intensified in the aftermath. According to her stepfather Tom, Chris ramped up his abusive and controlling tactics even showing up at their home to harass the family for information on the investigation. Rachel's father took matters into his own hands after three years went by without an arrest. He began putting up large billboards around Clear Lake City displaying sketches of the possible suspects created by police based on witness descriptions. One sketch depicted a young blonde male and the other a female with unusually large eyes peering out from under a bandana. A man who happened to see these billboards recognized the female sketch as resembling a woman he had met before in drug rehabilitation. He contacted the tip line and said the woman's name was Christine Paulilla. According to the tipster, Christine had made incriminating remarks during treatment about involvement in an unsolved crime. With this new lead, police launched an urgent manhunt to locate Christine. They eventually tracked her down in a dilapidated San Antonio motel room alongside her new husband Justin Roth. The conditions were unimaginable, rotting food, piles of drug paraphernalia, over 70 discarded needles, and feces littering every surface. Christine and Justin were arrested on the spot. In a desperate bid for freedom, Justin immediately offered up a full confession. He claimed Christine had admitted to him on numerous occasions that she was present at the murder scene and actively participated in the violent massacre of her friends under Chris Snyder's influence. Armed with Justin's testimony, police brought Christine in for interrogation. However, she was experiencing visible withdrawal symptoms from heavy narcotics use and her mental state appeared fragile. Nevertheless, she waived her Miranda rights and consented to speak without legal counsel. Over multiple lengthy interviews, Christine gave conflicting and inconsistent accounts of that fateful afternoon. She bounced between accusing Chris as the sole perpetrator to reluctantly admitting she was at least partially involved. Christine's statements contradicted known evidence and each other on crucial points like who initiated the violence, how the weapons were obtained, and her precise role. It became clear she was omitting and downplaying incriminating truths. Meanwhile, Justin provided detectives with a detailed timeline corroborated by forensic analysis, establishing Christine as a fully willing participant not merely an abused victim as she claimed. Cell phone records also showed over 1,000 calls from Christine to Chris in the months after the slayings, disproving her claims of fearing for her life. In October of 2008, Christine finally faced a jury of her peers in a multi-week trial. Prosecutors sought life imprisonment without parole for the brutal execution-style slaying of Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus and Aldebert in their own home. Despite attempts to paint Justin as solely responsible out-of-reward money motives, the jury saw through the deception. They convicted Christine on all four counts of capital murder after less than three hours of deliberation. The judge showed no mercy in his sentencing agreeing life without parole was the only just punishment for such monstrous acts of premeditated evil. To this day, the friends and families of the slain victims continue struggling to find peace or closure. Tiffany's father has chosen silence as the only way to manage his unending grief. Marcus's parents are still coming to terms with the loss of their vibrant son at such a young age full of promise. And Rachel's mother speaks of the void left in her heart that can never be filled again. As for Christine, she remains incarcerated in the Mountain View Unit in Gatesville, Texas, likely until taking her final breaths behind concrete and razor wire well into old age. What started as a story of friendship turned to the deepest betrayal and cruelty imaginable. An important lesson on how jealousy and obsession can twist even the kindest of hearts into the darkest of monsters. This tragic case shows how childhood trauma can profoundly impact someone throughout their life if left unaddressed. It also highlights the danger of toxic relationships and how they can manipulate and control victims in insidious ways. Ultimately, this is a complex story with no easy answers. While justice was served for the families of Rachel and Tiffany, I can't help but feel sorrow for all involved. I hope telling Christine's full story provides some insight into the complex issues of mental health, relationships, 
and how we can do better as a society to prevent such devastating outcomes. If you found this exploration of a true crime case interesting, please hit the like button below and consider subscribing to my channel. I'll be sharing more real-life stories in the future as a way to both inform and start important discussions. Your support helps me continue sharing these types of meaningful stories. Thank you as always for watching, and I hope to see you on the next video.